Good morning chaps, welcome along to the vlog. We're starting a little bit late really this morning, but I did go in over the weekend to work. And yesterday, um, me and the kids had a little bit of fun at home. So, um, yesterday afternoon, me and Abigail decided to have a play around with some of her favorite things, which are bath bombs, which is why we're starting the vlog from home this morning. So yesterday, we sat down and we made some unicorn bath bombs. Check those little beauties out. And at the same time, they work by the way, sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, citric acid, aroma and colour. But at the same time, whilst I was doing that, I thought I'd have a little dabble at cold processed soap as well, because I've never made that before. So I went out and bought myself some of the finest olive oil and coconut oil that money could buy. Well, Morrison's own brand at very least. And we got some caustic soda, sodium hydroxide, and we made our very first cold processed soap. I didn't film it because I already had a lot of editing to do over the weekend. And, well, I'm no expert, so I don't want to be telling anybody how to do this if I don't know how to do it myself and thus causing them, I don't know, maybe to get some chemical burns from, from the caustic or something, who knows? But anyway, I think it's turned out all right. So this has been setting overnight and it's gone solid. So now what we have to do is turn out the soap, cut it into bars and then let it cure for four to six weeks before we use it. And in that time, I'll probably, probably, blah, blah, make quite a bit more, I think, because I really enjoyed it. And the variety is humongous in terms of scents and colors and everything else. We did have a play with this one, putting some colors in there as well. So I've ordered some more dyes from the internet because I used food coloring. I don't think that was exactly the right stuff because some of them wouldn't work like the blues. But it's as varied and intriguing process as beer making, believe it or not. I can understand why this is a massive hobby and just a few quick searches on YouTube revealed a massive soap making community on there and loads of people on Instagram as well posting their unique designs. I found it really interesting. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Bear with me while I cut this soap regardless and then we're gonna go into the brewery and carry on. Okay, so we've changed our position to one which to suits what we're about to do. Here is said loafy loaf of soap. So all I'm going to do is just basically turn her upside down and let her drop out. And that's the first time I've seen the bottom of this particular bar of soap. Oh, it's still a bit creamy. You see, look at the colour of that. It's come out more like a toffee orange colour, well that was meant to be, believe it or not, green. And then we've got some red in there and as you can see on this side some orange. And I can already feel the soap melting in my fingers so I'm going to go ahead and get it cut as quickly as possible. So I'm going to think how big are the bars of soap wanting to be. We'll do one there, maybe one there. Maybe that's 10 bars. That should work then, I think. So let's just go for it. Oh, look at that. We did get some patterning on the inside after all. We've got some red, we've got some orange, and we've got lots of white. I added a little bit of blue dye into the white. Obviously it didn't work. But this soap is still, yeah, maybe they call it a gel phase. Maybe it's still going through a bit of a gel phase. But that makes it nice and easy to cut so we'll just go ahead and cut it for today and then it can continue to cure while I'm at work of course I'm very impressed though oh it's very soft and easy to cut at this stage apparently if you leave it until it's cured and try to cut it it's nigh on impossible. 
pinch a little bit of that side. So there we go. And then apparently it's best on a rack, but I don't really want to put it on a rack in case it starts to melt through the bars. So what we'll do instead is we'll place our bars of soap on this little cutting board like that and hopefully we'll be able to fit them all on maybe just stacking a couple on top like that just get rid of this little bit and there we go that looks like cake but it ain't cake of course it's definitely soap, but I'm really actually quite impressed at the quality and the look of it actually. So we'll be making more of this without a doubt folks. Right, anyway, let's go into the brewery and continue cladding our fermenters. With the magic of video editing, here are five tanks that have obviously freshly been clad. Ah, oh, it's got a ring to it. So uh, most of these tanks actually went off without a hitch, but unfortunately one or two of them um, are going to require the installation of the retaining bands are these little beauties here so we've got some steel ordered for that uh, but you can see that one or two places the actual screws have let go and they ping off but don't worry that band in there is literally just to support the weight of everything once we get the retaining bands on and tightened up then we've got the one at the top of course and we'll put this one just above or below these screws and that will hold everything in place and it won't fall off and this one as well I don't know if you look at it it's got a slight diagonal twist to the timber but I might be able to just knock that out when the bands go on but nothing to worry about so yeah really pleased with them the next job which isn't essential right away is to insulate the cones so we'll just use a little bit more of this as you can see it works really quite well but we do have some condensation on the outside because it is oh look at that filled up with water because it is indeed so cold so that one's condensating on the outside because it's sat at 5.3 that one's not because it's sat at 11 9 and this one is also at 5.3 so let's have a look now that one's not as bad as it look but it does have a bit of condensation on there but it's better than nothing at all right that foam insulation is definitely better than nothing at all so I guess what I'm gonna do now is plumb in the pipe work put on the lids which are all stacked down here 
and then I can start to get the place looking a little bit tidy. We're doing a little bit of a brewery tour on Wednesday for uh, a networking group in North Knotts, so I want it looking spick and span for them. One little job that I need to do is uh, cut some mirror for the sliding wardrobes that we've put in at home and I just so happen to have three pieces of mirror uh, from when we took on the brew shed, the original brew shed, because it used to be a hairdresser's of course. So I thought why not cut this mirror on camera because I'm out of practice and uh, it could all go drastically wrong. In fact it probably will. So what I'm going to do is get myself a relatively straight edge. That is not one. Maybe this bit of ply will do a better job. There we go, that's a straight edge there. That looks good. And then we want to be measuring up to cut the glass. So I'll bring you in a little bit for this so I can talk through exactly what I'm doing. So here I've got what's known as an oil filled glass cutter. So I've used one of these for many a year. I used to work in a glass shop as a teenager or early twenties. And what you do with these is you take the back off and you fill them with a cutting oil. Usually any oil will do, like a three in one. And then in this part of the head, uh, it moves in and out because there's a wick in there and that wick transfers the oil <coughs> to the tip and on the end here is a uh, tungsten carbide wheel uh, if you can just about make it out there and that little wheel is what does the cutting the Kunstdun tar glide so what we're going to do is try this is a very old cutter this has got to be oh, in 2019 this is probably 15 years old maybe longer it's called a TC 17 by the way made in Japan <clears throat> and the offset from the edge of this to the tungsten carbide wheel is three millimeters so when we're setting up to make a cut for instance what we'll do is take our dimensions which is 550 in this instance. So we'll find 550 on the workpiece. <clears throat> and then because we're going to be cutting um, up against the actual T square, if you like, we want to add 3 millimeters on to our dimensions. So 553 for this particular cut. There we go, 553, 553, now I'm just going to go back and forth a few times to make sure that we dial this in, 553, because normally you'd use something along the lines of a proper T-square which would have um, a right angle built into it at the bottom here, but this doesn't, so just gonna have to use brute force in ignorance. 553, and then once that's in position, I'm gonna be pressing firmly on the square so it doesn't move. Then we're gonna make the cut in one motion. You don't wanna go back over the cut again, because if you do, then there's a massive chance that the cut will run. So you need to do this basically in one. Beautiful. That worked really quite well. So let's come and have a look at what we've done. So you can see, just there, there's a score line running all the way down from one side to the other. So that score line is where the glass is gonna run when we go ahead and break it. And the way we're gonna break it is by bringing it off the edge of the table and then we're basically going to grab one side 
either side of the cut with our finger and thumb and we're just going to lift and kind of do that motion at the same time. Bingo, all the way up. Now this particular mirror has got some safety backing on it. That means that it's got some sticky back plastic on that stops the mirror falling to pieces if it's smashed whilst mounted on the wall. Very easy to get rid of, I'll just walk over here, pick up the blade, and as you can see we've now got the mirror cut in half, and we're just gonna run Stanley blade up and down on that sticky back plastic and that's our off cut piece that edge is now razor sharp whereas the other edges on this particular mirror have been rounded off they've been polished so we're going to do something similar to this so that nobody cuts their fingers on it whilst it's installed at home so a really convenient tool for just taking the sharp edge off of a piece of cut mirror or any glass for that matter is a good old two-tone sharpening stone it works a treat and you can use the rough side initially It's best as well to run up and down the glass instead of side to side. If you go side to side, you could put some stresses on it or cause the glass to what's known as shelling, where you get little kind of half moon shells crack out of the edge of it. go and then just feeling that section there it doesn't feel sharp at all it doesn't feel like it's going to cut you at all you wouldn't normally be able to do that on a mirror or a piece of glass once it's been cut because they usually are razor sharp and there we are that if we can get a shot on the edge which I think is probably going to be really quite difficult but that is the edge there we go polished up and made safe to mount on the wall so if any kids come along and they want to rub their finger up and down it they're not going to cut themselves spot on so that's one piece I've got three more of these to cut and uh, well, there's a shot of the old cannon 80D look, there we go folks, that's how I zoom in and out, eh? how do you like that? So I'm going to cut these other pieces of uh, mirror and then we'll carry on with the tanks. Well as we know folks it is Monday, it sure is Monday and uh, well look at this, 20 past seven i've put the hours in today don't you think so you'll notice it looks a little bit different over here if indeed you do notice that's because we were storing our hops in these cabinets and i fetched this fridge down from the pub because we're not using it there and i've just filled it up with the hops just to keep the heat off of them i don't want to lose any 
and then what can't fit in there I've thrown in cold room four so they're sat in there keeping cool and also down here as well before I bugger off I finally 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 got round to changing this light switch and we've put the chiller sockets in which means we've now got a socket up here and those other another cable runs up and across to the back of the fermenters to chill that. I also managed to get this pipe work clipped in. This is the drain for the condensation traps in the cold room. So that now runs outside, that's perfect. Sorry for the shaky camera work while we just have a bit of a recap. But I've been really busy today. All the tanks are finished. As you can see, I've just screwed the control boxes on, uh, but we've still to wire the heating elements in and the pump, the valves, if indeed they're gonna have valves. The three tanks that are gonna be um, having their own cooling system, their own maxi chiller, three of these tanks will get their own and one of them will share this Evo, uh, two of them will share this Evo 70. So the ones that get their own don't need a valve because when the pump turns on, it's only pumping into one tank. So we can do away with the valve for those. I might install them anyway, uh, at least they're in, but I don't have to right away because if I install them anyway then it future proofs the whole thing so if we get a devoted glycol system for a full set of tanks getting rid of these maxi chillers and kind of consolidating our energy output to one system then it would require a valve for each one but it wouldn't be a difficult retrofit in the future just to stick these on it would literally just be a push fit and two wires that's all there is to it everything else is already there as you can see we've got plug sockets in that's ready for these maxes to be plugged into and we've had a good tidy up Stu's over there washing casks for us so we can get this beer out of tanks tomorrow and then brew on Wednesday so the fact that I'll be brewing on Wednesday means that all of the other projects, including the uh, pilot brew kit and everything else, has to go on hold. But doing this work today has made me think about one more project that I do think is important to stick onto the itinerary, and that is an extension to the cold room. So this fridge just ain't big enough to hold all the hops. But if you look at the space that we've got, kind of from here, all the way across to here, and let's say out this far, you know, maybe to, to where this beam is, then that is a considerable amount of space. It's probably um, two of these shelves, quite frankly. So what I'm thinking about doing is taking this panel out from the inside of the cold room, extending the cold room this way, just kind of that depth that I talked about up there, and then putting these two shelves this side and just having an extended shelf area in cold room one. So we can put two pallets worth of beer in there and we can also keep all of our hops refrigerated just here without the need of buying another fridge or running the electricity for another fridge. I think it's a good move and I think it's something that can be done in half a day, maybe a day with very little uh, material outlay. In fact I've got all we're going to require in terms of insulation to have some upstairs. We've got some spare knocking about up there, look. You can just about see it. So I bet you that's enough to do the job. So with that said, uh, and considering the time of the day, I think it's about time I locked this door and went home to a nice cold beer out the fridge at home. 
I'm drinking tins at the minute, I don't have anything until we cask that stuff um, tomorrow. Then I'll be able to take a corny of vacant gesture home. So yeah, that's what we're going to do boys and girls. We'll wrap it up here, go home, edit the vlog. It's going to be 8 o'clock before I even put the SD card into the computer. But I feel we've really broken the back of everything today. Thanks for coming along for the ride. As always, we'll see you tomorrow.